Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 26 It was not until the evening, after family prayers, that Angel found opportunity of broaching to his father one or two subjects near his heart. He had strung himself up to the purpose while kneeling behind his brothers on the carpet, studying the little nails in the heels of their walking boots. When the service was over they went out of the room with their mother, and Mr. Clare and himself were left alone. The young man first discussed with the elder his plans for the attainment of his position as a farmer on an extensive scale, either in England or in the colonies. His father then told him that, as he had not been put to the expense of sending Angel up to Cambridge, he had felt it his duty to set by a sum of money every year towards the purchase or lease of land for him some day, that he might not feel himself unduly slighted. "'As far as worldly wealth goes,' continued his father, "'you will no doubt stand far superior to your brothers in a few years.' This considerateness on old Mr. Clare's part led Angel onward to the other and dearer subject. He observed to his father that he was then six-and-twenty, and that when he would start in the farming business he would require eyes in the back of his head to see to all matters. Some one would be necessary to superintend the domestic labours of his establishment whilst he was afield. Would it not be well, therefore, for him to marry? His father seemed to think this idea not unreasonable, and then Angel put the question. "'What kind of wife do you think would be best for me, as a thrifty, hard-working farmer?' "'A truly Christian woman, who would be of help and a comfort to you in your goings out and your comings in. Beyond that it really matters little. Such a one can be found. Indeed, my earnest-minded friend and neighbour, Dr. Chance. But ought she not primarily be able to milk cows, churn good butter, and make immense cheeses, know how to sit hens and turkeys and rear chickens, to direct a field of labourers in an emergency, and estimate the value of sheep and calves? Oh, yes, a farmer's wife, yes, certainly, it would be desirable. Mr. Clare the Elder had plainly never thought of these points before. "'I was going to add,' he said, "'that for a pure and saintly woman you will not find one more to your true advantage, and certainly not more to your mother's mind and my own than your friend Mercy, whom you used to show a certain interest in. It is true that my neighbour Chance daughter has lately caught up the fashion of the younger clergy round about us, for decorating the communion table, altar, as I was shocked to hear her call it one day, with flowers and other stuff on festival occasions. But her father, who is quite as opposed to such flummery as I, said that it can be cured. It is a mere girlish outbreak, which I am sure will not be permanent. "'Yes, yes, mercy is good and devout, I know. But, father, don't you think that a young woman, equally pure and virtuous as Miss Chant, but one who, in place of that lady's ecclesiastical accomplishments, understands the duties of farm-life as well as a farmer himself, would suit me infinitely better?' His father persisted in his conviction that a knowledge of a farmer's wife's duties came second to a Pauline view of humanity, and the impulsive angel, wishing to honour his father's feelings, and to advance the cause of his heart at the same time, grew specious. He said that fate or providence had thrown in his way a woman who possessed every qualification to be the helpmate of an agriculturalist, and was decidedly of a serious turn of mind. He would not say whether or not she had attached herself to the sound low church school of his father, but she would probably be open to conviction on that point. She was a regular church-goer of simple faith, honest-hearted, receptive, intelligent, graceful to a degree, chaste as a vestal, and in personal appearance exceptionally beautiful. 
"'Is she of a family such that you would care to marry into a, a lady, in short?' asked his startled mother, who had come softly into the study during the conversation. "'She is not what in common parlance is called a lady,' said Angel unflinchingly, "'for she is a cottager's daughter, as I am proud to say. But she is a lady, nevertheless, in feeling and nature.' "'Mercy Chant is of a very good family.' "'Pooh! What's the advantage of that, mother?' said Angel quickly. "'How is family to avail the wife of a man who has to rough it as I have, and shall have to do?' "'Mercy is accomplished, and accomplishments have their charm,' returned his mother, looking at him through her silver spectacles. "'As to external accomplishments—' What will be the use in them in the life I am going to lead? While as to her reading, I can take that in hand. She'll be apt pupil enough, as you would say if you knew her. She's brim full of poetry—actualized poetry, if I may use the expression. She lives what paper poets only write, and she's an unimpeachable Christian, I am sure, perhaps of the very tribe, genus, and species you desire to propagate. Oh, Angel, you are mocking! Mother, I beg pardon, but as she really does attend church almost every Sunday morning, and is a good Christian girl, I am sure you will tolerate any social shortcomings for the sake of that quality, and feel that I may do worse than choose her." Angel waxed quite earnest in that rather automatic orthodoxy in his beloved Tess, which, never dreaming that it might stand him in such good stead, he had been prone to slight when observing it practised by her and the other milkmaids, because of its obvious unreality amid beliefs essentially naturalistic. In their sad doubts as to whether their son had himself any right whatsoever to the title he claimed for the unknown young woman, Mr. and Mrs. Clare began to feel it as an advantage not to be overlooked, that she at least was sound in her views, especially as the conjunction of the pair must have risen by an act of providence for Angel would never have made orthodoxy a condition of his choice. They said finally that it was better not to act in a hurry, but that they would not object to see her. Angel, therefore, refrained from declaring more particulars now. He felt that, single-minded and self-sacrificing as his parents were, there yet existed certain latent prejudices of theirs, as middle-class people, which would require some tact to overcome for though legally at liberty to do as he choose, and though their daughter-in-law's qualifications could make no practical difference in their lives, in the probability of her living far away from them, he wished, for affection's sake, not to wound their sentiment in the most important decision of his life. He observed his own inconsistencies in dwelling upon accidents in Tess's life, as if they were vital features. It was for herself that he loved Tess—her soul, her heart, her substance, not for her skill in the dairy, her aptness as his scholar, and certainly not for her simple, formal faith professions. Her unsophisticated, open-air existence required no varnish of conventionality to make it palatable to him. He held that education had as yet but little affected the beats of emotion and impulse on which domestic happiness depends. It was probable that, in the lapse of ages, improved systems of moral and intellectual training would appreciably, perhaps considerably, elevate the involuntary and even the unconscious instincts of human nature. But up to the present-day culture, as far as he can see, might be said to have affected only the mental epiderm of those lives which had been brought under its influence. This belief was confirmed by his experience of women, which, having latterly been extended from the cultivated middle class into the rural community, had taught him how much less was the intrinsic difference between the good and wise woman of one social stratum and the good and wise woman of another social stratum, than between the good and bad, the wise and the foolish, of the same stratum or class. It was the morning of his departure. His brothers had already left the vicarage to proceed on a walking tour in the north, whence one was to return to his college, 
and the other to his curacy. Angel might have accompanied them, but preferred to rejoin his sweetheart at Halberthays. He would have been an awkward member of the party, for though the most appreciative humanist, the most ideal religionist, even the best-versed Christologist of the three, there was alienation in the standing consciousness that his squareness would not fit the round hole that had been prepared for him. To neither Felix nor Cuthbert had he ventured to mention Tess. His mother made him sandwiches, and his father accompanied him on his own mare a little way along the road. Having fairly well advanced his own affairs, Angel listened in a willing silence as they jogged on together through the shady lanes to his father's account of his parish difficulties and the coldness of brother clergyman whom he loved, because of his strict interpretations of the New Testament by the light of what they deemed a pernicious Calvinistic doctrine. Pernicious, said Mr. Clare with genial scorn, and he proceeded to recount experiences which would show the absurdity of that idea. He told of wondrous conversions of evil livers of which he had been the instrument, not only amongst the poor, but amongst the rich and well-to-do, and he also candidly admitted many failures. As an instance of the latter, he mentioned the case of a young upstart squire named D'Urberville, living some forty miles off, in the neighbourhood of Trantridge. "'Not one of the ancient D'Urbervilles of Kingsbeer and other places?' asked his son. "'That curiously historic worn-out family with its ghostly legend of the coach and four? "'Oh, no! The original D'Urbervilles decayed and disappeared sixty or eighty years ago, at least, I believe so. This seems to be a new family which has taken the name. For the credit of the former knightly line I hope they are spurious, I am sure. But it is odd to hear you express interest in old families. I thought you set less store by them even than I." "'You misapprehend me, father. You often do,' said Angel, with a little impatience. Politically I am sceptical as to the virtue of their being old. Some of the wise, even among themselves, acclaim against their own succession, as Hamlet puts it. But lyrically, dramatically, and even historically, I am tenderly attached to them." This distinction, though by no means a subtle one, was yet too subtle for Mr. Clare the Elder, and he went on with the story he had been about to relate which was that, after the death of the senior so-called d'Urberville, the young man developed the most culpable passions, though he had a blind mother whose condition should have made him no better. A knowledge of his career having come to the ears of Mr. Clare when he was in that part of the country preaching missionary sermons, he boldly took occasion to speak to the delinquent on his spiritual state. Though he was a stranger, occupying another's pulpit, he had felt this to be his duty, and took for his text the words from St. Luke, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. The young man much resented this directness of attack, and in the war of words which followed, when they met, he did not scruple publicly to insult Mr. Clare without respect for his grey hairs. Angel flushed with distress. Dear father! he said sadly. I wish you would not expose yourself to such gratuitous pain from scoundrels." "'Pain?' said his father, his rugged face shining in the ardour of self-abdigation. "'The only pain to me was pain on his account. Poor, foolish young man! Do you suppose his incensed words could give me any pain, or even his blows?' Be reviled we bless, being persecuted we suffer it, being defamed we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world, and as the offscouring of all things unto this day. Those ancient and noble words of the Corinthians are strictly true at this present hour." Not blows, father. He did not proceed to blows. No, he did not, 
though I have borne blows from men in a mad state of intoxication. No. A dozen times, my boy. What then? I have saved them from the guilt of murdering their own flesh and blood thereby, and they have lived to thank me and praise God." "'May this young man do the same,' said Angel, fervently. "'But I fear otherwise, from what you say.' "'We'll hope nevertheless,' said Mr. Clare. "'And I continue to pray for him though on this side of the grave we shall probably never meet again. But after all, one of those poor words of mine may spring up in his heart as a good seed some day." Now, as always, Clare's father was sanguine as a child, and, though the younger could not accept his parents' narrow dogma, he revered his practice and recognized the hero under the pietist. Perhaps he revered his father's practice even more now than ever, seeing that, in the question of making Tessie his wife, his father had not once thought of inquiring whether she were well provided or penniless. The same unworldliness was what had necessitated Angel's getting a living as a farmer and would probably keep his brothers in the position of poor parsons for the term of their activities. Yet Angel admired it none the less. Indeed, despite his own heterodoxy, Angel often felt that he was nearer to his father on the human side than was either of his brethren. End of chapter 26